Welcome to this week's episode of Reading the Gospels Through Hebrew Eyes. The raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11. That's going to be the focus of our video this week. It's a long reading. It's about 45, 46 verses. So it's kind of like last week's video where we covered the entire story of Jesus healing of the blind man, also in the Gospel of John. But it's worth spending enough time with to where you kind of get a good grip on what the narrative itself is portraying, kind of the background of some Jewish beliefs about the resurrection, and most especially what Jesus means when he says that life and resurrection aren't just kind of abstract things, but they're rooted in his own flesh and blood, who he is and the authority by which he is able to conquer death. So a lot of great stuff to get to. We're going to jump right in with verse one, the first few verses, and see who we're talking about, kind of what the context is, and then we'll run from there. So John 11, one through four. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. Kind of pause here for a second. It's kind of a a foreshadowing here because at this point in John's gospel, we haven't heard about Mary anointing the Lord with ointment and wiping his feet. That's going to be in the next chapter, chapter 12, verses 1 and following. But John is either assuming that we know the story already or we've already heard the gospel of John. But anyway, hasn't happened yet, but he's kind of getting the characters introduced here. Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. So Lazarus is ill. So what do the sisters do? Well, they sent to Jesus and they said, Lord, he whom you love is ill. So your friend, the one that you love, your beloved friend is, is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of Man, Son of God, may be glorified through it. So it might be a little bit confusing at first because, of course, as we know this from the story, Lazarus does die, so this does lead to death. What Jesus is saying in kind of the big picture of things, this doesn't lead to ultimate death because, of course, Jesus is going to, at the end of our story, he's going to raise Lazarus back to life. And with this idea of, of the glorification of the Son of God, I don't think that this merely means that the Son of God is going to receive praise because of what happens, but rather this is going to lead to a series of events. The raising of the death of Lazarus and the raising of Lazarus is going to lead to a series of events, which which then puts into place Jesus' own death and resurrection. So if you continue reading, we're not going to go all the way there in John 11, but if you keep reading past, oh, around verse 46 and 47, you hear about how, ironically, the raising of Lazarus raised the ire of Jesus' enemies so much so that they decided they were going to put him to death, which is a just on the surface such a strange idea. This guy that raised somebody to life, we're going to make sure that we kill him. But that's what happens. And so Jesus' raising of Lazarus then sets in motion this series of events which precipitates his own death and resurrection, which in John's gospel is the glory of God. So the manifestation of the glory of God is in kind of a theology of the cross sort of way, is in the crucifixion itself. Not where we would expect. His glory is revealed through his suffering and death. So this is going to lead to the glorification of the Son of God because it's going to lead to his own death and resurrection where the glory of God is manifested for us to see. Okay, so that kind of sets the context. We're introduced to Mary, Martha, Jesus, Lazarus, who's ill, and kind of the way that Jesus is thinking his way, speaking his way through what's about to transpire. Next, verses 5 through 10. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, The Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Of course, that is in the narrative preceding this one. The Jews were angry at Jesus. They were trying to to kill him. So they were trying to stone you. And are you going there again? In other words, that sounds crazy, Jesus. They were just trying to kill you. And why would you be going back? Why would you put your neck on the line like this? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, notice the words in bold. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So Jesus loves this family. So, or therefore, you could also translate that. Therefore, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. So this, of course, is 
it is strange on the surface, but it's really not when you hear the entire story. Jesus is purposefully delaying going to where Lazarus is so that Lazarus will not just be dead, but will be good and dead for will be a tire in uh, a period of four days by the time he gets there. He wants to make sure that there's no doubt whatsoever that his friend that he loves is not just as it were, maybe, you know, very ill or he's gone into a coma or something like that. No, he's dead. Stone, cold, dead. In order that when Jesus raises him back to life, there might be no suspicion whatsoever of foul play. Maybe one of the reasons also that he waited as long as he did is because we know from we know from later Jewish writings, we're not exactly sure if this was something already accepted in the first first century, but there's a, there's a high likelihood it was. Anyway, we know from later Jewish literature that there was kind of the idea that for the first three days or so after someone died, their soul or their spirit kind of hovered, as it were, around their body, and then when decomposition took started becoming obvious and the spirit departed. So, Maybe that was already believed in the first century. If so, then it kind of makes sense. Jesus is going to wait till those three days pass. And then on the fourth day is when he's going to show up and work his, work his miracle. Now, his response is kind of, a, kind of a typical strange Jesus sort of response. You know, sometimes you, you ask him a, qu- a simple question and he gives you some kind of esoteric sounding answer. Now, what he means by walking in the day and walking in the night is basically this. So both the Jews and the Romans kind of divided the day into, as far as like the big picture of a day, into two segments, the 12 hours of daylight, the 12 hours of night. And of course, if you're walking in the daylight, then the idea is you're fine. You're not going to stumble. You know where you're going. You start walking around at night without any light where you're going to fall. What he seems to be implying is, listen, uh, it's still kind of the God's daytime hours for the work of the Messiah and for you, my disciples. So as long as we are walking in the light, in other words, doing the Father's will, going about his business, I and you with me, we're going to be okay. We're not going to stumble. In other words, don't be afraid of those who are trying to stone us. Uh, nothing is going to happen outside the Father's will. It's not yet time for me to die. And when I do, you are not going to die with me. So it's good. We're going to be safe. We're walking in the light. That seems to be what Jesus is implying by this figure of speech about walking in light and walking in the dark. Next section is going to be 11 through 16. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples, obviously confused, said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. So it's one more example of kind of how the the disciples are portrayed very frequently as kind of not getting it. Things kind of go over, go over their heads. So they they think he's talking about him, you know, actually going to sleep. Well, of course he's going to wake up. Why would we go wake him up, Jesus? Then Jesus spoke more frankly. He told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I love that phrase, for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. A lot of great stuff to get to here. First of all, I want to talk just for a second about something that's a, it's, it's, it's a favorite topic of mine. Uh, and maybe you've heard me say it before. Or maybe you've seen this in some of my writings. I've shared this graphic on social media. If you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you may have seen it before. So koimeterion, that's the Greek word for, for cemetery. And it actually literally means a sleeping place. So when we call it not a graveyard, but when we call it a, a cemetery, a sleeping place, a koimeterion, we are confessing the resurrection. We're saying on the last day, there will be this, this place will be like a huge bed, this cemetery, where the sleeping will awake, some to life and others to death. So the next time you visit a cemetery, remember that you stand on resurrection soil. I love the fact that cemeteries are sleeping places because those whom we love, those whom we have buried there, they are they're just waiting. This is, their, this is their bed. Their their bodies, of course, their bodies are dead, but they're, as it were, sleeping because God isn't done yet with their bodies. He will raise them on, on the last day. Now, what about this image or metaphor or figure of speech or whatever you're calling it about death being sleep? This confuses some people. Uh, and what Jesus is saying is it confuses people because... There, there, there is this idea out there that the souls are asleep. 
And they're, as it were, just going to instantly wake up like no time will pass between when they died and when the resurrection happens. That, that's not the way the Scriptures speak. The scriptures speak of the body sleeping, and this is actually lifted from the Old Testament. We see it several times in the New Testament, but it's actually taken from the Old Testament. So if you, uh, it, a couple different places or sections of Scripture. So if you go into First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, it is, I did a search on uh, Logos Bible software, and it's all over the place. So, so and so, whatever the king might be, or whoever the person might be, slept with his fathers. The Hebrew word is shakav, which can mean to to lie down, uh, but also can mean to sleep in death. So, you have that all over Kings and Chronicles, sleeping with the fathers, that is buried with the fathers. Daniel twelve two, also one of the famous resurrection passages in the Old Testament, also uses this image. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, in other words, their bodies are buried in the earth, and that's where they are sleeping in death, they shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Of course, that being there, a uh, a figure of the general resurrection. So all those who sleep in the dust will awaken, some to everlasting death, and some to everlasting, everlasting life. So the idea of sleep, the idea of death, rather, physical death, being asleep of the body, that's fairly common. Uh, in King's Chronicles and also in that passage from, from the book of Daniel becomes seemingly more common as you get closer and closer to the, to the first century. Now, about our friend Thomas, what do we always call him? Well, of course, he's the only disciple, the only disciple in, in front of whose name we put an adjective. Of course, we call him Doubting Thomas, and that is based upon a, a later narrative in the Gospel of John. It's a, it's a pet peeve of mine that we attach this label to him and call him Doubting Thomas, as if all of us have never doubted. I mean, come on. We, who, who are we to throw stones at someone? And so if, if you're interested, I wrote an article about this uh, a few years ago called We Are More Than the Skeletons in Our Closet. And I'm picking up here upon what Thomas says. He said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. In other words, hey guys, why are you so afraid? Uh, Jesus is going, and so if Jesus is going, I'm going to go with him. Well, so much for doubt. How about, why don't we call him Courageous Thomas? Why don't we call him, you know, Faithful Thomas? Why don't we call him the, the guy that sticks with Jesus Thomas? But we don't, of course, it's because as we all tend to do as human beings, we like to pick out some negative aspect of someone's life and attach that to them instead of actually either picking out something positive or at least getting a kind of a, a general broad perspective on who they are as a person. So I love the fact that this is a much different side of Thomas than we typically hear. He is saying, let's go with him. Our master is going, and so that's where we're going to. And if he's going to die, we'll, de- we'll die with him. So three cheers for, for Thomas and stop calling him Doubting Thomas. If you call him anything, call him brave or courageous Thomas. Okay, moving on from there. Let's see what happens uh, when Jesus arrives on the scene. So this is going to be verses 11, 17, rather, 17 through 27. Now, when Jesus came, that is when he, when he showed up, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Now, in the Greek, this uses uh, the, the measurement of a, of, a, of, a, of a stage. So 15 stadia, or 15 stades, is the, the Greek reading there. And one stade is 607, 607 feet, so a little, bit less than, uh, a little bit less than two miles. And Bethany is located uh, east of Jerusalem. It's kind of on the other... If you've been to Jerusalem, you've been on the Mount of Olives, and you've kind of faced Jerusalem then it's on the other side. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be there in my visit to Israel, but maybe I'll be able to, to visit there my next my next trip. Anyway, so it's uh it's on the other side of the mount, east side of the Mount of Olives, about two miles, a little bit less than two miles from Jerusalem. Anyway, close enough to where many of the Jews, uh, presumably friends or family from Jerusalem, had come to Martha and Mary. Of course, they're coming to console them concerning their brother. As, you know, people still do this today, of course. We, we, we take care of those who are grieving, and that's what's happening here. Now, Martha heard that Jesus was coming, and so she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Now, isn't this also consistent with the personalities that are given to us about these two sisters? Remember back in chapter 10, 
verses 39 and 40, this famous situation where Jesus is a visitor in their home. And what does Martha do? Well, I mean, Mary, first of all, sat at the Lord's feet. The Greek verb there for sat is a, uh, a close cousin to the one where Mary remained seated in the house here in, in John chapter 11. So Mary is a, is a sitting kind of person, we could say. She's sitting there, both in grief as well as when she was at the Lord's feet. Martha, on the other hand, who's probably the older of the two sisters, she's a very much of kind of a take charge, uh, be very active, go-getter kind of woman. And so she gets up and goes out to meet Jesus. Mary stays behind. We'll pick up with Mary's story, story in just a minute. But anyway, Martha gets to Jesus and she says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Which, you know, given everything that we know about Jesus was a a very high likelihood. He would have healed him, right? So that's what she's, the assumption she's working with. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Well, that's, that. what a great confession on the part of Martha. We don't want to take anything away from her. That's true. She trusts that, she might not know exactly what, but she knows that, that Jesus is going to get what he asked from his father. Well, Jesus responds to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha says to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now, hold that thought for a minute. We're going to we're going to come back to Jesus response in just a minute. But I I think this is a good point to just kind of put on the brakes and reflect on the fact that what Martha just said to Jesus is in complete conformity with what she has probably heard from his own mouth. Jesus, if you go back to John chapter six, I've got the verses on the screen here for you. In John chapter 6, that, of course, that famous bread of life discourse, not once, not twice, not three, but four different times talks about raising people up in te escate hemera in Greek, on the last day or at the last day. That's what he says. He says, I, I'm not going to lose anything the Father has given me, but I'm going to raise it up on the last day. And then he goes on to say, I'm going to raise it up on the last day. No one can come to the Father unless he who sent me draws him, and I'm going to raise him up on the last day. (laughs) Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And again, I'm going to raise him up on the last day. So what Martha is saying is basically, Jesus, I know. I've heard from your own lips, not once, but many times, that you promise that on the last day you are going to raise up people. So, you know, I know that on the last day you're going to raise you're going to raise my brother Lazarus. So, on the one hand, Martha's been listening to Jesus and she's repeating back to Jesus what he has taught. And I want to add this too. What Martha says is in complete conformity with the widespread confession of first century Judaism. So, if you if you if you look at the cumulative evidence that we have from Old Testament, New Testament, the first century Jewish historian Josephus, the first century Jewish philosopher down in Egypt, Philo, the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as contemporary Jewish works like the Apocrypha, especially the books of the Maccabees, and books like Jubilees, Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. Anyway, all this literature, the cumulative evidence from all of this shows us that the the predominant belief of first century Jews was this. Number one, those who died would be resurrected. It's not like when you died, that was it. You know, non-existence. No, those who died would be resurrected. And two, This would be a bodily, a physical resurrection. So not like some kind of bodiless afterlife in heaven as a soul. No, there's going to be a body, bodily resurrection. Third, and this is the important part, this would happen to everyone, or at least the faithful, simultaneously and only on the last day. Now, the only exception to that, as you probably know, are the Sadducees. Uh, those people especially connected with the aristocracy and the priesthood. We know both from the New Testament as well as from the writings of Josephus that they denied the resurrection. Now, the point here is that when Martha says, I know, I know that he will, he will rise on the last day, she's, number one, echoing what Jesus has taught, and number two, she is confirming what was the widespread belief of her fellow Jews in the first century. Yeah, on the last day, Lazarus will rise. So you can't fault her for saying that. It's not like she was somehow mistaken in her confession. What she, what she does, she knows the truth. Let's put it that way. She knows the truth. She doesn't know the whole truth. And she's about to hear the whole truth from the lips of the one who is truth himself. So, picking back up with the narrative. 
Martha says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus drops this bombshell. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And then Martha says to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ or you are the Messiah, the Son of God who is coming into the world. What a beautiful confession on the part, on the part of Martha. So kind of breaking this down into what Jesus, what Jesus says, says to her. First of all, he says, I am the resurrection, meaning that resurrection is not just kind of something in the abstract, some kind of abstract promise. It's rooted in in the person of Jesus Christ. That is so crucial to get. The, the promise of the resurrection is as sure, as certain as the, the body of Jesus Christ, in particular, the crucified and resurrected body of Jesus Christ. Because the body of Jesus is resurrected, therefore we know that we who are in him shall be resurrected. So resurrection is not some abstract thing. It is connected specifically and really only to the resurrected flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. Deny the resurrection of Jesus and you have no hope. So that's why the Christian confession of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is not something you can give and take as a Christian. It is a, you, you, that, is a, <laughs> that is a must confession. If you deny the resurrection, you are not a Christian, period. No physical resurrection, you're not a Christian. I mean, because that, that, that you can't get much more you can't get any closer to the core of what the Christian faith is all about than the confession of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus was not bodily resurrection, but bodily resurrected, we have no hope and we are to be pitied more than all men. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ is crucial. So that's the first part. He says, then I am the life. What does that mean? Well, it means that all the, the source of life itself, again, is not kind of something in the abstract, but it's rooted in him. He is the source of life itself. Because he's the source of life, he's the source of this new life that will come in the resurrection. And then we have this, this, uh, this putting together of two phrases, which both of which are significant. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So, yeah, people are going to die. Lazarus just died. True. Uh, we've all lost loved ones, right? But even though they die, if they believe in Jesus Christ, yet shall they live. So there's the promise again of life. And this life is connected to the faith that we have in the one who is the resurrection and the life. So Christ is resurrection. He's life. And by faith in him, even though we die physically, yet shall we go on to live. And then he concludes by saying, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Well, I thought he just said that you would die. Well, okay, this is, the, this is the beauty of what he's saying. Yeah, you're gonna, your, your bodies will sleep in the earth. Your bodies will physically die, but you're not going to die. You're not going to everlastingly die. In fact, what's going to happen to a Christian when, when they die? Well, we're just going to basically walk from this life into paradise or to the presence of Christ or to heaven or whatever you want to call it. And there we will await the resurrection when our bodies will be awakened from sleep and physically, gloriously resurrected once more, just like the body of Jesus Christ. It's such a beautiful promise. And it's such a comfort, not just to us personally, when we think about our own lives and our own death, but to us who are, who are grieving. I mean, last year, as many of you know, last year I lost both my, my son in July and my dad in October. It was just a terrible year of, of grief and, and sorrow, and, I'm, and of course I'm still dealing with this, but what I cling to are verses like this from, from the mouth of Jesus himself. Those who believe in Christ, even though they die, yet shall they live, and whoever believes and believes in him shall never die. That's what my son believed. That's what my dad believed. That's what I believe. I know that's what you who are watching this video, who are Christians, you believe this as well. What a comfort to, to all of us that our life and our resurrection, all these promises are as sure and certain as Jesus himself. Well, we got more to get to, so let's keep moving. We have verses 28 through 37 next. So now Mary's going to show up. When she had said this, that is when Martha had said this, 
she, I, I guess she goes back home and she gets her sister Mary. And she said to her in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. So when Mary hears this, she gets up quickly. She goes to meet Jesus. Jesus hadn't come into the village. He had not come into Bethany yet. He was still where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her, with Mary in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, well, they follow her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. So I guess Martha kind of whispered to Mary, hey, Jesus is here. The teacher is here. He wants to see you. So Mary got up. So Mary is going to be followed by all of these people. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him basically the same exact same that exact same that Martha had said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved. Now we're going to go, we're going to come back to that Greek verb in just a minute and discuss what it, what it might mean and imply. So, but we'll stick with the ESV translation, which is a pretty common English translation of this, deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? So where's the tomb at? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then of course, the famous two word biblical verse, Jesus wept. Come back to that too. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. That's their interpretation of the weeping of Jesus. But then, of course, there's some who said, couldn't he, have op- couldn't he who opened the eyes of the blind man, again, that was last week's reading, couldn't he who have opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? And of course, they're not wrong. He could have. I mean, if he could restore sight to a guy born blind, well, certainly he could have kept his friend alive if he had been there. So let's deal with this uh, translation of deeply moved and what it mean, what it might mean, what it might imply. So the Greek verb itself is embremaomai. And it, it can, of course, mean a lot of different things, as most verbs can. Deeply moved, yes. Also can have, uh, both in animals and in people, this idea of a kind of a, a snorting. Also, warning sternly or admonishing urgently. So it kind of... Don't take it, in other words, just as kind of a, uh, a very uh, emotionally laden, compassionate response. It has an edge to it, you know, this stern admonishment. In fact, if you look at the other usages in the New Testament, such as Matthew 9.30, this is when Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about this. He's telling people to keep it quiet. Again, Mark 1.43, Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. So this is when Jesus is healing people and telling them very sternly, admonishing them, you know, very seriously, don't spread word of this. Now, Mark 14.5 is when ointment that could have been sold for all this money uh, is, is poured upon Jesus, and then they scold her. Again, this is the idea of kind of a, of, of a negative edge to this. And then the other two usages are here in John chapter 11. So how are, we to, how are we to understand this? Well, I think a pretty good argument can be made that Jesus is, yeah, yes, he's emotion, he's showing emotion at this. Obviously, he's showing emotion at this. But what kind of emotion is it? It seems due, due to the way this, this verb is used that Jesus is, is upset. He's not just, as it were, grieving, but he's mad, uh, uh, irritated, upset. But I don't, my, this is my interpretation. I, we don't want to, it's difficult, you know, when you're reading emotions, especially in a text this this ancient, it's kind of hard to to know exactly what's going on. But what seemed to be happening, in my, from my perspective, is that Jesus is is upset, he's irritated, he's angry, not at the people, not at the people. They're grieving. Come on, they're grieving. Of course they're grieving. He's upset because of the whole reality of sin and death and the devil and everything that's brought about a situation where these things happen. So he's not mad at people, but he's mad because of death. He's upset because death has claimed the life of his, of the one that he loves, this this dear friend of his. And I think any of us who have deeply grieved know what that's like. You get angry, you get upset. You're not angry, upset necessarily at the person or other people, but just at the whole situation, the, the, the messed up world where these terrible things, these terrible things happen. So that makes perfect sense. And then when it goes on to say that Jesus wept, that's not, how can you have anger and weeping? Well, that happens all the time with people. When people are angry, they often cry. So I see Jesus emotionally wrapped up in this situation where he's angry about sin. He's angry about death. He's angry that, that his, that his friend has died. Of course, don't discount the fact that he's grieving because he loves Lazarus, but 
he's also he's also weeping because he he is is fully human. He has all has all the same emotions that 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 we have as well. He's also of course fully God, and that that's going to be shown in what he what he does next. But don't discount the fact that he's also fully human. I'm I'm so happy that we have a God who weeps, a God who has emotions, a God who knows what it's like when you when you lose when you lose someone. So anyway, that's that's kind of leading up now finally to this last section. This is going to be verses 38 through 46. Then Jesus deeply moved again. Again, there was that same, that's that same Greek verb that I've been discussing. So then Jesus deeply moved or, or upset or whatever, however you want to translate it. He goes to the tomb. It was a cave, not uncommon, of course, for uh, for bodies to be buried and in uh, tombs had been hewn into the rock or caves. Uh, of course, we're going to have this same thing happening with the body of Jesus in his burial. A stone lay against it. Again, not uncommon. Same thing that we have happening in the, the burial of Jesus. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, again, it's kind of the, the, the take charge kind of person. She steps forward once more, once more here. Uh, she's the sister of the dead man. She said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor for he has been dead for four days. The old King James, behold, he, he stinketh. Uh, and he would, of course, because a decomposition begins very, very quickly in, in the days, of course, without refrigeration or without embalming or anything else. Uh, it, it doesn't take very long for a body not only to begin to decompose, but also to have a, a very obvious odor about it. And, and Lazarus has been in there for four days. Good grief. Come on. It, he's gonna, it's going to be terrible if you take the stone away. Jesus again reminds her, hey, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God, which must have, <laughs> which must have shut Martha up. So he's like, hey, I'm just reminding you of, what, of what, what we talked about. So they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes. And before he says anything with, with regard to Lazarus, he prays. He prays it publicly. He says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Presumably then he's already prayed for what he's about to, to do. So thank you for hearing me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. In other words, what you're about to see is an invitation to faith. So he says this, he ends his prayer. When he'd said it, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And as all the old preachers love to say, and I still, and I still love to say it and to hear it, the reason that Jesus specified Lazarus and didn't just kind of give a blanket come out was because if he hadn't specified Lazarus, every single tomb within earshot would have emptied. So he says Lazarus, so that only Lazarus comes out. And the man who had died, the one who was stone cold dead, now is alive again. He comes out hands and feet bound with linen strips because that's what they did with the bodies. They would bind them up in these linen strips or these blankets. His face had been wrapped with the cloth. Again, this is echoing what happens at the burial of Jesus. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Lazarus and had seen what he did, believed in him. Again, that's exactly what Jesus speaks in the prayers, right? That they may believe that you sent me. So their reaction to this was belief, but there's always a but, but some of them who some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And you can you can read in the the rest of the chapter, of course, how this then precipitates leads to uh, plotting to put Jesus himself to death. So this is uh, this is the the story. I mean, there's many more things that I could say about it, but uh, hopefully that is kind of gives you uh, at least a few details and a better appreciation for what's what's going on. But my main takeaway from from the story of Jesus raising Lazarus is that death is a defeated and a defenseless coward in the face of Jesus. He can say, "Lazarus, come forth," and there's not a thing that death can do to stop him. The power is all in Jesus Christ because, as he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And because of that, Jesus can say to death whatever he wants to say, and death must submit and obey its master. What a great encouragement to all of us. We have nothing to fear, certainly not death, because we believe in the one who is the resurrection and the life, the one who died and rose again 
on our behalf. May that be of comfort and hope to you, even as it is to me. I won't be here next week, by the way, with a video. Next week is Palm Sunday, and I uh, already have two videos out on Palm Sunday, so you can, uh, you can check those out in the index of readings that I have at 1517.org. Thanks, and a blessed Holy Week to you, and a blessed celebration of our Lord's resurrection. We'll see you soon.